pero que tengo tres grandes jugadores aquí conmigo que estarán a, 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 a contestar esta pregunta. Y si te, les parece bien, voy a, hacer, uh, voy a cambiar para inglés ahora. Uh, so, uh, I'm very proud uh, and honored to be here on stage uh, in the name of the Johan Cruyff Institute together with uh, three brilliant uh, football, former football <laughs> players. I think we have the whole team here. We have an Icelandic defender, uh. an Australian midfielder, and a Peruvian forward, and a very lucky fan. Uh, and today, what I think we can bring of value here to the, to the stage and to you, most importantly, is, is, is to discuss this role that uh, uh, players can play. Uh, just briefly before we start, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the Johan Cruyff Institute. Uh, could you put the next slide, please? Uh, well, we are an uh, educational institution. We were founded uh, almost 20 years ago by Johan Cruyff himself uh, with the idea of bringing professional, uh, giving an opportunity of professional football players to start developing uh, their careers afterwards. And obviously, we have grown uh, much, much larger than that. Uh, but the idea, initial idea, was based on this quote of Johan of saying that his dream, uh, his vision of sport was actually to, to, uh, to see uh, football, sports in general, being managed by people that are passionate about uh, sports. And obviously, football, football being managed by people that are passionate about football. Uh, And that's what he created uh, almost 20 years ago with the Cruyff Institute. Uh, we are, uh, we started small, but we have been growing very, very large as time goes by. We now have almost 10,000 uh, students of these. Uh, we are very proud, very, very proud, and please pay extra attention to this number, uh, as we have 250 players, uh, Uh, current and, and retired football players on our alumni base, and we are very proud of, of, of providing uh, players to, to, you know, to, be, to, to, to enhance uh, 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 the vision of Johan uh, to these to this players. Uh, we have 64 programs, uh, 14 delegations worldwide, uh, and we were uh, uh, elected the second best online pro master's program worldwide uh, by Sports Business International. Uh, we have several different bases uh, in different continents. Uh, our headquarters in, is based in Barcelona. Uh, obviously, Amsterdam is a big, is a big uh, uh, a venue for us. We also have uh, offices in Mexico, uh, Sweden, and um, we are expanding worldwide all the time. Uh, so we offer, in the Institute, we offer services in education and consultancy for sports education. Uh, we have many I have seen here across uh, uh, the Congress, happy, very happy to see a lot of alumni here. Uh, uh, and we are very, very proud to be helping to develop the football business. Uh, and to talk a little bit further today about it, uh, the question, because also here at the state, I've been here today, I've been to the, other, to the former uh, uh, World Football Summit editions, and we, one thing that strikes us is that uh, We talk a lot about the football business, uh, about football companies, football clubs. We, we rarely s ever see football players on stage. And what I would like to, to, to discuss here, debate this here with you, is that is this a natural thing or is this a, an unbalanced thing? And what should be done? To, if, if it's unbalanced, what should be done to correct this? Or if it's a natural, what are the causes for this? So first, please, uh, Craig, if you could. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, hello, everyone. Firstly, thank you for the invitation to speak and to represent Cruyff uh, and the great Johan Cruyff, of course, always uh, a great privilege I take very seriously. Uh, to my fellow panelists, lovely to see you, and to everyone here. I feel as though I'm representing Australia or perhaps the Asian Confederation here, so I have to try and do my very best. Uh, it's a wonderful topic for us as former professional football players is because the interest that we have is Many people in football always say, as a sort of a cliche or a truism, that the game is based on the players and the fans. The players and the fans. 
And in the last couple of hours sitting here listening to everyone uh, talk, giving their presentations, outstanding as they are, so much of it is about uh, monetization of fans, about commercialization of football, about investment in infrastructure, all of which is incredibly important. But at the heart of the game are those two major stakeholders. But when we talk, certainly in Australia and in Asia in particular, and I wonder about here uh, in Spain and in Europe, when we talk about former players being involved actively in the game, there seems to be a cultural issue. Uh, and if you look around the world in all confederations, I'd like to see some research actually, perhaps, perhaps Federico has done some with FIFPRO, I hope so, to tell us how many former professional players actually have inherited key positions within the game. I'll run through a few a short um, a points of interest for you in a moment. But generally speaking, uh, firstly, there's been no, to my knowledge, not for a very long time anyway, there's been no former professional football player or legend of the game as president of FIFA. We had one very close recently who got caught in you know, the webs that football has tended to weave and that was a great disappointment to all of the professional players around the world because we believe that the playing culture, uh, the professional footballers culture has to be above what's continued in the game. Typically, uh, former players have been engaged in ambassadorial roles to utilise their connection with the fans, and that's one very important aspect that so many of them bring. Also on the sporting director side, so it's not difficult to understand that the technical side of the game needs technical minds. And so we look at uh, Chiki Bagiristan, for instance, uh, and Buchogeno is a wonderful player, legend, who's involved with Real Madrid. And all of us players around the world are very aware that these uh, players are in key positions. But we're talking here about the institutional side of the game. So my proposition to you today is to challenge you, to get you to question your own environment, and to propose that around 90% of the management talent in the game of football, that is coming from the players, is underutilised. I'm going to run through now just a few key points quickly about why I think that's really important. Well, firstly, I think we can all agree that football has and perhaps still is facing a global crisis of values, certainly of ethics, that's become very clear, and I would say of long-term vision. So as much as we talk about investment in the game, we still can step back and say, well, how healthy is football? Because health of the game has many, many facets, and one of them one of the core facets must be the values, must be the ethics, and must be the respect and understanding of where game, the game should go in the future. Let's, take, let's see, for instance, the situation we have now with these mega transfer deals and, and your, our philosophical position aside. I'm sure there's many agents in the room, but for most of us in the game, we think that to be, to, to be spending 20, 30, 40 million euros on a single transfer into the hands of external individuals is quite absurd. That's money that can be invested into the game and it's certainly, I'd argue, money that can be invested into the future of the players, which is the game. So when we talk about education of players, usually we talk about well-being. Everyone says, well, when you're playing, they should engage their mind elsewhere because it does, and research says that players who study, even at the top level, the very top level, who have additional external study uh, uh, it, it gives them the psychological tools and the time and the distance on an external sense to deal with the internal pressures of football. So the research is very clear on that. In Australia and other places we still have a cultural issue regarding players and in particular coaches allowing, enabling or we would say encouraging uh, current professional football players to actually study during their career. And there's this archaic feeling that football players should be only football players and nothing else, that they shouldn't study, as though you can train or think about football 24 hours a day. We all do, but sometimes players, it's very good, the research says, to disconnect. But rather than the well-being of football players, what I'd like to ask you, our audience, is 
Instead of the well-being of the person, what about the well-being of the game? I believe that in training the other 90%, I believe about 12% of professional players worldwide have a university uh, education. <clears throat> in training as great a proportion as possible of the remaining playing population, we're actually safeguarding the future of the game and safeguarding the future of your institutions. Let's say, take Francesco Totti, for instance. <clears throat> Francesco, a great legend, of course, has now retired, likely to become an ambassador. And why does the club feel it's so necessary to utilise his brand? Is because he speaks to the fans and he speaks for the fans. And many of the presentations here this morning is about spending millions of euros to build that connection, is it not? We've got all the newest technology in the world. We've got everyone, some wonderful minds in the room, uh, strategizing how to connect with those people. And then Francesco Totti makes the cut through like that. So if Francesco Totti was to be able to be educated, as an example, be educated to work inside the institution, does he not then bring that set of values? Does he not bring that connection with the fans? Does he not bring his exceptional mental acuity, speed of thought, and uh, uh, innovative capacity. I noticed recently in the NFL, there's somewhere around 40% of retired players are involved in entrepreneurial or their own self-managed businesses, an incredibly high number for any sport. Those types of gifts, the players can bring inside the institution. So I'm talking about your general director, I think is in Spain, or your CEO, as we call in Australia. There's an immense talent pool that's being completely underutilized. The question is, how do we do it? So what do they bring? The gratitude, they bring the domain-specific knowledge, of course. They bring the club values and connection, which is priceless. They bring respect for the essence of the game. They bring sporting values, something you might agree with me that we've largely lost. And they bring leadership. The business of football, I'll argue, is managed a little bit like what you understand here, to use the analogy, not in an offensive way, but the Galactico policy that you remember, i.e. We, we recruit expensive and skilled management expertise either externally to the club or certainly often externally to the game, rather than have our own management cantera inside to bring these players through to work for the club, to inherit the values and take the game forward. We all agree with the ideal, and this is not to be exclusionary, we, we're talking here about the best talent to be in the best positions within football. Players understand that. That's our business. Our business is the best make the field. We understand competition. My argument is that football is not giving current or former players the opportunity to prove that they can be the best in some of these managerial roles. And that was the vision of Johan Cruyff. That's why he put together the Cruyff Institute and it's come why we came to study there. What's the solution? Create better pathway for players during their career, to invest in education for them, uh, to provide pathways off the field as well as on, to educate, promote and retain. So my question to you is, how can we do that within the game broadly? How can we change the culture? Can we become the most educated sport in the world? And I see no reason why not. To have the most educated playing workforce. Great examples recently, uh, Giorgio Chiellini, all of you will know, the great Juventus defender, uh, graduated with his MBA, I think, from the University of Turin in the same period when they were making Champions League finals. What a week that was. And he is a fantastic model, I think, not just for us, but for players and clubs and federations and confederations globally. Can we educate our players better while they're coming through? FIFA has a big challenge and FIFA Pro have a big challenge as well. I think there should be uh, education available for all current professional football players. They are the heart. They're the ones that spill blood and they deserve the right to training and opportunities within the club. Two propositions. Firstly, that FIFA and FIFA Pro are going to come together to provide some online learning, football specific, so that we start to create a culture of players coming through within their own club, or perhaps their own federation, or, or their own confederation. 
and one day a professional, a legend of the game as president of FIFA. And the second is to tell you a little bit about finally about what's happening in Australia. We value education very highly, particularly our PFA, Players Association. At, at, uh, at uh, <clears throat> Southern Expansion, which is one of the bidders for a new licence in our professional competition, what we uh, intend to do is to have young players training to study in three ways. They study online, study external course, they study football of course to become a great professional, to become a socceroo is to represent our country and one day win the FIFA World Cup, we pray and dream. But thirdly, they actually train inside the club. So one afternoon a week we're going to give them the opportunity to now come in and be mentored as a young player and to understand the different functions institutionally, not just in the technical sense. And in this way, the greats who go on to represent our club well can move inside in any role with no bias, no prejudice, which we see as the best pathway, we see as best for the club. Uh, or secondly, those who don't make it, and we know that that's the vast majority, the largest percentage, they can then work within a club that they believe in, they love, and that they have a connection with. Two propositions I hope that you'll consider today. Thank you. All right, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Greta, you're a living legend of Icelandic football, a living legend of Bolton Wonders, uh, and a living example of this that we discussed, uh, a former football player with an executive career in a, in a football league club in England. Could you tell us a little bit more about your case? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Greta. I come from Iceland. A, a very proud moment for Icelanders going first time to the World Cup. Um, I would consider myself a little bit different than most footballers. I, uh, I come from a small, small town in the north of Iceland with just over a thousand people living there. You need to get through three tunnels to get there. There's no airport and if it's snowing you're stuck. Um, I only become a professional footballer at 23. So I was a semi-pro and I had to do my studies before, as everyone else in Iceland. So we value uh, education extremely highly. Um, on, the, on the topic was, um, I became professional in, 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 when I was 23. I moved to Switzerland from Iceland and I was there for six months. Had a really good relationship with the, a former player who was a sporting director. Uh, I got bought to AZ Alkmaar in Holland with uh, Van Gaal as the manager. And during my three years, I had an extremely high valued, um, how do you say it, contact time with the sporting director, the, the, the chief scout, the owner, Van Gaal himself, obviously, uh, marketing, anything related to the football club. Um, I get transferred to England, the Premier League, Bolton Wanderers, fantastic organisation. Um, I spoke to the CEO twice in five years, I spoke to the owners once and all of those were less than saying hi and goodbye. Um, the problems that I noticed in English football was that not during the, the, the time of the manager, it was actually when the manager got sacked, when I realised what's wrong with English football, is that the, the, there's nothing behind it's, it's smoke and mirrors really in, in England. There's a lot of money being spent on various things and, and there's nothing behind it. Um, on the topic, when we go back to the topic, I want to play a little bit of the devil's advocate on, on both sides of, of, of selecting people to run the business and of the positives and, and the, uh, the, the negatives. Um, if we start with the, with the, with the positives, um, one thing leads to another, so I'm, I could have picked more positive and negative, but I decided to pick just a few of them. I, I start with the credibility. Walking into a room as a former footballer gives you a little bit more of credibility. And the higher level you play, the more credibility, even though your level of uh, knowledge is just the same as, as below. Um, sitting there, talking to players, talking to, to agents, you get a, you go, get a more buy-in on the football side, on the technical side, as you have, you, you've been there, you lived it, you've been probably in the same scenario or situation before. Um, there's also a lot of things off the football pitch that, that as a sporting director or technical director you need to f pay attention to and without the credibility to get the buy-in from the football staff uh, probably would take a longer um, for a non-footballer to, to push it in action and something that would have probably take months or years was possible to do in a, in a, in a day. There's a unique experience being a football player. 
um, it's it's impossible to learn. Being in a, in a in a roller coaster of emotions constantly, week in week out, is a is a quite an experience. Um, taking that into the into the back office is is, is crucial. Being able to influence uh, decision making, um, living the life under pressure, and, and I'm not saying pressure is very good. We perform under pressure. Um, taking that into the into the into the world of, of decision making is 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 very in, in, important. Um, Supporting the uh, department's knowledge, so each department in the football club is going to be the scouting, the the, uh, the medical, sports science, the coaching. It's very important to have a technical knowledge and understanding. Um, if you play the game for many years, you you do understand what every player goes through. You understand the limits and the time when you do sprain an ankle or or, or, or you are scouting a player. So understanding the process, being able to sit in a room and knowing when when people are pulling, you know pulling wool in front of your eyes or something, you, you have a better in-depth in knowledge of what's, what's actually happening and you can make a very judgmental call on um, what is nice to have and what we have to have. Um, working with big personalities, big personalities can be football coaches or managers, they can be players, can be agents, coaches, sports scientists, uh, doctors. Um, and having the ability to learn from a very, very young age as a footballer to, to learn and, and be in a room or, or uh, dealing with, with, with professionals is, is a skill that, that takes years to master and is, is constantly growing. If we go into the negatives and, and being a footballer, especially at the highest level, we, we do live in a bubble. Um, we, are, we are told to when to wake up, we're told to where to go, we're told what to wear. Um, there's a very... Limited, limited things that we need to think about. We got agents to look after us. We got uh, players liaisons. We got uh, um, um, how these lifestyle management companies that look after us, and, and you, d you don't have to do anything. So really, the only time that you're challenged is five times a year, five times a week for for fit 90 minutes each. So that's the only time you're challenged, and then we're asking those people that only get challenged for that amount of time to run a football business. Mm. So. We're going then to the transferable, the limited transferable uh, experience or the education is, is, is clearly the lack of education. There's very few players that you can sit down that have a two year deal or one year deal to sit down with them and say, right, we're going to think about what's going to happen when you get 29, 30, 32, because you, your career can, can end very quickly. Um, to get them to buy in that is very hard, very difficult. Um, and Players believe that at a very young age they're going to make it, they're going to be multi-millionaires like everyone on, on, on Instagram and they don't need to educate themselves. But we know that there's a very small, lim a small percentage of, of players that actually make it and, uh, and, 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 and that's something that is very concerned for, for me being a, a former football player. Given that there is a very poor, like, like Craig says, a very poor uh, internal uh, talent scouting in football clubs. No one pays attention. Like I said, we're both to Wanderers. There was no chance that anyone would have thought me being anyone different than anyone else in the football mm. club. I was just uh, one of these, uh, well, if I may say this, one of these stupid footballers. Um, because we are branded, we are in a bubble. Um, clubs don't really care about the individuals, just as much as players don't really care about the institution they're playing for. But it, it, it does come to the unconscious bias that, that Craig also mentions, is that players are labelled, players are stereotypical, said they are idiots. Uh, no clubs or in, in, in federations or football clubs do uh, want to research, want to see those who are different, want to spend time with them. Um, I was very fortunate at Ace at Alkmaar that I was given an extreme contact time with, 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 with people. Um, I have no idea if I was... Um, identified or people just wanted to speak to me because I, I probably had a lot of silly questions that people wanted to take time to answer. Um, but I do believe that there's a very important to have football people in the room when decisions are made. I do believe that we need to be very careful of who they are, that they're not the wrong people because there are a lot of wrong people in football. A lot of wrong footballers have been employed in very key roles. Um, I do believe that that footballer regardless of how well educated he is, he still has limited time that he learn the experience. He needs someone by, him, by his side. I think it's very important that the CEO or the managers around him 
uh, can support him where he needs, where he lacks. But at the same time, he can support him being a, a high-performance athlete. Like we said before, they, we, we bring something to the table that, that many um, do not have as, as their experience. Brilliant. And uh, now I'll switch to Castellano, Fernando. Uh, como presidente de, de FIFPRO Américas, uh, todo este trabajo, estos desafíos que los jugadores tienen uh, para progresir, progredir en sus carreras después que, 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 que se jubilan. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo, por su experiencia, veniendo de un mercado muy distinto como es la América uh, y, y también con la experiencia como jugador, ¿cómo, cómo ves este desafío? Sí, bueno, primero agradecer a la, a la organización y al Instituto Johan Cruz por la invitación. La verdad que el, el mérito que tenemos, que tenemos, digamos, los tres que estamos acá, que somos exfutbolistas, que nos formamos durante y seguramente después de la carrera, ¿no? Y nos preocupamos un poco del, de este segundo proyecto de vida que es cuando acaba el fútbol, ¿no? Este, la FISPRO, al igual que sus asociaciones miembros, pues este, estamos muy preocupados con el tema de la educación porque finalmente pues, el, el fútbol tiene, tiene, tiene una, un, una etapa que se termina y después hay que afrontar y hay que estar preparados para ese cambio. Y la educación es importantísima para eso. ¿no? Entonces, hablábamos ahora de los... Me ponía a pensar las ventajas de un exfutbolista ¿no? eh, para, poder, para poder trabajar dentro del ámbito del fútbol y algunas cosas se las escuché a, tanto a Greg como a Greta. Pero básicamente es conocer el sector, conocer el vestuario, ¿no? que es básicamente el corazón del fútbol, conocer, conocer los códigos de los futbolistas, cómo se manejan este, y que finalmente te da llegada a ese camarín y esa, y, esa, y esa credibilidad. Y después también, entre otras cosas, está que los futbolistas están preparados para, para trabajar en equipo y a trabajar bajo muchísima presión. ¿no? Este, digamos que esas son, entre muchas cosas, las ventajas que tiene un futbolista eh, por haber jugado al fútbol, pero eso no es suficiente. Los futbolistas tienen que formarse, tienen que eh, invertir en su educación, prepararse y prepararse para el futuro para poder tener herramientas que los ayuden para las gestiones que puedan re realizar a futuro. ¿no? Y ahora me gustaría cambiar de repente un enfoque porque acá ya es un tema regional, o sea, ¿qué pasa en América? ¿no? Y en América tenemos una realidad de repente diferente a lo que contaba Greta de, de, de Islandia, de que la educación es muy importante, ¿no? En América tenemos que, que la educación dentro del ámbito de los futbolistas, normalmente la gran mayoría de los futbolistas de nuestro continente vienen de, eh, de una condición socioeconómica probablemente baja ¿no? y no tienen acceso a buena educación porque en muchos de nuestros países la educación pública no es muy buena. E inclusive tenemos algunos países en los cuales a los futbolistas se los saca de la escuela para que se dediquen a jugar fútbol. Acuérdense que somos un continente exportador de jugadores. Y veía estadísticas, y tenemos estadísticas que en algunos países del continente, sobre todo Sudamérica, este, llegan hasta el 25-30% de futbolistas que no han acabado la escuela. Entonces nos encontramos con un verdadero problema, ¿no? Y el problema es qué pasa el día después, ¿no? Y le llamamos, el tema es qué pasa el día después que se acaba la carrera porque los futbolistas están sumergidos en una burbuja, ¿no? Y que creemos cuando estamos jugando que no se va a acabar nunca. Porque es una burbuja especial, donde te mimas, te tratan bien, ganas un dinero más, menos, pero un dinero importante, ¿no? Este, pero finalmente este periodo de futbolista, pues se termina y nos encontramos que hoy tenemos en la realidad muchísimos futbolistas que acaban la carrera acostumbrados a ganar una cantidad de dinero importante y no saben qué hacer con su vida. Y el mercado laboral no le da el valor que le daba como futbolistas. Como futbolistas les podrían pagar muchísimo dinero por jugar al fútbol, pero si no están preparados para la vida, pues este, el mercado laboral este, los valora con muy poquito. Entonces es ahí la importancia ¿no? de, la, de, la, de, la, de la educación. Y aquí es donde entra a tallar un poco el tema de qué hacemos. Y aquí como FISPRO América y, y, como, y como asociaciones de futbolistas, pues tenemos todo un reto. Y un reto que hoy estamos haciendo. Hoy en todos los países de América, los, las asociaciones de futbolistas, pues nos encargamos. Hoy estamos, nosotros damos primero cursos de nivelación para que los chicos que no acabaron el colegio puedan terminarlo. 
Y de ahí tenemos, para los chicos que lo acabaron, los más formados, pues hay un poco de todo, ¿no? Cursos técnicos, un poco de idiomas, para que puedan hacer una carrera de, de entrenadores, otros querrán hacer una carrera de gestión deportiva, otros querrán este, estudiar en la universidad. Y eso es lo que estamos tratando de impulsar desde el continente, porque verdaderamente es un problema grande, y ya no solamente para que trabajen dentro del sector, sino para que puedan iniciar un nuevo proyecto de vida, porque cuando se acaba la, el fútbol profesional, pues lo que te da es, oye, ¿cómo rehago mi vida? Me manejo, me quedo dentro del sector del fútbol, sería espectacular, pero no hay trabajo para todos probablemente, ¿no? Entonces, algunos tendrán más dinero ahorrado que otros, podrán, podrán empezar una, una gestión empresarial o, o ingresar al mundo laboral, pero para eso es importantísimo pues, el haberse educado, ¿no? Así que este, creo que el, el, el problema lo tenemos detectado y creo que entendemos todos que la educación es una herramienta fundamental para el futuro de los, de los futbolistas cuando acaban la carrera. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Y esta pregunta para todos ustedes. Como jugador, going back to when you when you were training and traveling, how hard it is to dedicate yourself to other activities not related to football, how hard it is to study. Uh, is, it, is it something viable, you can do, anyone can do it, or do you need a specific set of mind to, 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 to go and, and, pr and study while you're training and playing? Um, from, from my part, from Iceland being that most of the players are multi-sport, play multi-sport. I played badminton, skiing, multiple multiple sports at the same time as an education i was working in an education at the same time and doing sports i don't think we challenge sports people enough i think we're, we're still we're protecting people too much we're protecting footballers and and, and we're really creating only footballs we're not create, creating or developing people so when someone becomes a, a slight hint of talent and a slightly rises above everyone else we 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 create a bubble around that person and we, we manage everything around him so he can, uh, again, become this elite sportsman in, for 90 minutes a day. We forget that a day is much more in the life and the chance of that little, you know, this boy or a girl becoming an elite sportsman is very, uh, very small. And I do not think that we challenge people enough. I think we're, we're our own to blame that we're not developing uh, sports people. We are not developing leaders. We're not developing... Um, people to, to go into society after the, their career um, and I think we've we've created a beast that we keep feeding and, and we really don't um, we, have, we have no plans how, how it's going to work when it fails. It's changed a lot in terms of the education so when we were coming through a long long time ago um, I was unable to complete a law degree because the amount of time that you had to attend and become an international player wasn't possible. Today the players can. So I think it's largely cultural. What, what gets me is that the game itself doesn't take the challenge to drive education across all of the professional playing group. So in other words, one Mata, I understand, has, a, has or is studying a sports science degree. Uh, Vincent Company is an outstanding candidate in, I think, an MBA. Uh, Giorgio Chiellini has just studied, uh, you know, finished his MBA in Turin. Uh, those of you of my vintage will remember the, the Dottore Socrates, who was a, a medical professional, uh, is from your country, Brazil, uh, was also uh, had a PhD in uh, philosophy. Uh, but today, in the modern game, some people will say, well, the demands on the players are too great to also be able to do so. But the research actually says the opposite, firstly that they're better off psychologically having external study, uh, which is a pressure release valve. And secondly, some of the top players in the world right now uh, prove that that theory is completely incorrect. So today, there's no excuse for players not doing so. From the cultural areas around the world makes a big challenge. In Australia, it's very important for players to study and the number, the incidence of players studying university degree and completing is rising very rapidly because for that very reason, our Players Association in Australia and, and, and progressively within Asia is pushing very aggressively to the players that this is what's important. So the game within the playing ranks needs to use these role models 
to let other players understand around the world what's necessary. The clubs are changing though too. I went a couple of days ago to Villarreal, I thought it was a fantastic model, so that the players are engaged fully to, to uh, Greta's point, the players are engaged fully, young players, fully all day, every day. But to say that players don't have a work ethic, I think is, is patently questionable because Look at the former players who've gone into coaching. Coaching has also changed. And those of you who run clubs and who are involved at that level will know that today the role of a coach is a 18 hour a day, highly technologically connected role. The amount of software that's here, the amount of interaction with other professionals around them is absolutely necessary to be a pro licensed coach in one of the top leagues in the world right now. They are in effect CEOs of their technical domain. When Horst Hitting came to Australia a few years ago, it was said very often that he could very easily be a CEO or a chair of a major corporation, and I'm confident that he could be. Uh, other other uh, foremost coaches right now would also, you would say the same thing, because it's about leadership, it's about innovation, it's about intellect, it's about the ability to leverage other people with skills that you don't have. So every CEO sitting in the room does not have the whole cake. The skill of top people is acquiring the knowledge that you don't have. That's what these conferences are about. The top football people work extremely hard and that's one of their great skills. Uh, so the portability of the knowledge and intellect and, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the ability to manipulate their own environment of those people who are all former professionals or the vast majority uh, is extremely high so I'm confident that a new generation of players coming through with an education will comfortably be able to take their skills into a different environment as well y Fernando como es hacer parte de, de la FIFPRO que es una, una organización formada por jugadores ex jugadores de fútbol, pero que no, no son más deportistas y están viviendo en un, un mundo corporativo y de una organización global. ¿Cómo es la interacción con, con ex jugadores que están eh, trabajando como ejecutivos en la, en la FIFRO? Eh, bueno, la interrelación desde ese lado es, es buenísima. O sea, tienes, tienes, tienes ex jugadores eh, formados dirigiendo normalmente las asociaciones de futbolistas, ¿no? eh, tratando pues de, desde, desde este punto de vista pues mejorar las condiciones de los futbolistas, porque finalmente nuestro trabajo es, nosotros representamos a los futbolistas profesionales, ¿no? entonces nuestro trabajo interactúa con los futbolistas activos de este momento. Entonces, ¿cómo llegas tú? La experiencia de exfutbolista te permite una llegada y, 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 y una llegada directa y por lo menos y, y, y trasladar un poco tu experiencia o la, la experiencia de compañeros de lo que viviste, de cómo haces para cambiar y mejorar el sector, ¿no? Y, y, y lo que hablábamos en antes, el tema, el tema de, de la educación es clave en este punto, o sea, y hay un mito en... en, en en que los futbolistas no se pueden formar durante mientras están jugando al fútbol y esto no es cierto los futbolistas de repente son dentro de los trabajadores los que más tiempo libre tienen no para dedicarse eh, ya sea incluso ahora con tantas facilidades que hay de manera online o de manera directa para poder invertir un poco de este de este tiempo que tienen no en poder prepararse y ese es un poco nuestro reto eso es lo que le hacemos llegar a nivel global y a nivel de cada país que lo hacen lo hacen lo hacen en, en Australia que tiene una muy buena asociación de futbolistas este lo hacen en toda Europa lo hacen en Islandia lo hacemos en Perú lo hacemos en toda América se hace en todo el mundo donde, donde, donde llega la FIFPRO pues el trabajo que tenemos no comenzar a llegar con estos mensajes a los futbolistas y que se preocupen del día de mañana porque como hablamos antes este la carrera del fútbol es una carrera corta se termina y hay que estar preparados para el día después muy bien Uh, thank you. Uh, so now, if there's anyone who would like to ask a question for our... I, we can't really see if there's any questions. Uh, specific, there's one there. Uh, if you could ask, just screen. <laughs> Gracias por la necesidad de crear líderes, que bueno, 
que para mí lo de las, lo, 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 el término líder me parece un poquillo complicado, porque al final la formación debe ser abierta para todos y no solamente un Toti o un Aquilani deben de llegar a ser los tops y los que deben de tener esa formación, sino los que deben de tenerla todos o por lo menos accesible. El, a lo que voy, la necesidad de que crear la responsabilidad que tienen los clubs, eh, los de élite principalmente, en formar a sus jugadores, eh, las federaciones, de facilitar esa formación y de las ligas. Hay un término que nosotros, que está bastante abierto, eh, utilizado, que es la carrera dual, dual career. Y aquí de momento no lo hemos utilizado, precisamente por eso. El dual career significa la posibilidad de compaginar el deporte con los estudios o el deporte incluso con el trabajo, con esa accesibilidad a poder trabajar en, en los clubs. Quería un poco compartir esta, esta idea para ver si ven viable desde asociaciones, federaciones, eh, ligas, eh, esa necesidad de formar, desde, de crear esa idea de formación desde las, desde las bases. Muchas gracias. Fernando. Sí, bueno, eh, comparto contigo que esta debería ser una preocupación de todos, ¿no? Primero los clubes, hay muchos clubes que lo hacen, pero no todos, lamentablemente, ¿no? De que se preocupan de que por lo menos en las divisiones menores, este, los niños, pues, por lo menos estén yendo al colegio y de alguna manera lo siguen, pero no es la realidad de todos. Y sí debería ser, ya incluso a nivel profesional, pues, una preocupación de los clubes, de las ligas, de las federaciones, de las confederaciones, de la FIFA, de la FISPRO, de los sindicatos de futbolistas. Yo creo que es una preocupación de todos los estamentos del fútbol de ver cómo mejoramos pues, la educación de, de, de los futbolistas. Porque también hay otro tema, ¿no? Es, si tú tienes un futbolista mejor formado, el tema es, ¿podríamos creer que este futbolista mejor formado podría entender de repente mejor el juego, podría jugar mejor, podría, podría esto favorecerle a la hora de jugar? ¿No? Este, Creo que, 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 que comparto contigo que seguramente sería así, ¿no? Entonces, futbolistas mejor formados seguramente van a tener mejores profesionales para los clubes de fútbol. And Greta, do you think clubs should have the responsibility of educating players or do you think that's a responsibility of the player themselves? I think firstly you need to educate that player that you need to educate. Yeah, I think everyone's different. It's very difficult to push education on when, when players get get older um, I've, I've actually tried to sit down with a player and and try to add education into his into his contract to say that um, that we would guarantee him a certain education by the end of his contract the player liked the idea but as soon as he speaks to his advisors and people around him he said well you don't want to get paid that amount in education you want to be paid it in your in your in your pocket because the 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 the, the the percentage of the money paid in the pocket is paid is a percentage paid to the agent so it's it's very it needs to educate everyone around you need to educate the family the agents everybody needs to buy into that the player as the product needs to be educated to to not just excel as a football player but also excel as a as a, as a person when he gets further and that is very hard very difficult and and working in england is very di very very difficult uh, situation there at the moment Yeah, I agree. The thing is, I would say the game has an obligation to, to give the players the best opportunity. Not all will take the opportunity, but cultural change is hard. We've been through this process in Asia and particularly in Australia in our game uh, uh, over a long period of time, 10 or 15 years. We're talking about the medium term here. But the game has an obligation to ensure that the players have an opportunity to continue in the game. So those players typically who have an early injury, we know, they go immediately to Cruyff Institute, they get educated, they want to work in the game they love. I think the responsibility is on the game. I think FIFA Pro and FIFA have an obligation to put a program into place. But I also have sought to raise the question with you of what does it offer to your club or to your federation or to the game to have the, for, the uh, former professional players in key roles. And I think if you explore it and look at the, the model of Bayern Munich, I think the gentleman who introduced the panel here mentioned that immediately. That was his first response, and that's right. It's a wonderful model. It's one of the most successful clubs in the world. The CEO is Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. We all remember him. 
a goal scorer of marvellous repute and clearly a wonderful CEO. Uh, so their former players move straight within the club wise because they understand the values. They understand how to respect the shirt. They understand all these things. I'd like to see, we do, we do research on the player churn and the, the manager or coach churn and the expense to investors and clubs, uh, you know, from the sackings and so on. I'd like to see the management churn. I don't think there's been a, a study done into it, but I bet you it costs football billions of dollars. Why? It's because people are not tied necessarily to a particular club. But the people who are tied to the club are the fans and the people who've worn their shirt. Uh, and also those, of course, like many in the audience who've worked or grew up, you know, is a fan or worked in the club for a long time. But the players understand the shirt. They love the club, often. And when they move inside the club afterwards, I think that it gives something valuable to the institution. It brings in the meetings a level of no compromise. It brings in the discussions a level of what the club is about. And so rather than just in the technical roles, I would love that with an educated workforce, the game can further explore how they can undertake other key roles within the industry. It's brilliant. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming down here. Okay, uh, thank you. Sitting with us on the stage. But before we say goodbye, I just want to address the audience as in the beginning of our presentation, I mentioned uh, one specific number, one, and I'm going to make this question, uh, and I would like to know if there's one, someone brave enough to come on stage and try to answer it. Anyone would like to come on stage for that? <laughs> we have one here. Very good. <laughs> Very brave. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, your name? Vendetto, Ben. Vendetto. Come from Italy. Oh. I remember there were 64 programs and 12 I delegations. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not the question, Very but good. congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but the question now, uh, with the prize of a football sign by Johan himself, how many football players have studied with the Johan Cruyff Institute? 2,500. No. Oh, not bad, huh? Ah. Very good. 250. Yeah. Very, 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 very good. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all for good coming. Memory, yeah? uh, you can have more information on the Johan Cruyff yeah. Institute on our yeah. website. Yeah. Uh, we have fantastic education programs suited for all people that want to work thank you. within sports. Thank you. Uh, we'll take thank a picture you. with... Thank you, okay. Greg. Thank you, Greta. Right. Gracias, Fernando. Uh, it was brilliant. Okay. Thank you. 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 Bueno, Oliver, <coughs> muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias. No sé si la conclusión habrá sido que los deportistas, que los exfutbolistas han de manejar el, el, el negocio del fútbol, pero yo creo que se han dicho cosas muy importantes. Se decida lo que decida, tiene que haber gente de fútbol, tiene que haber jugadores en las mesas donde se tomen decisiones. Tiene que haber. Tiene que haber. Por otra parte, hemos escuchado también decir que el jugador conoce los códigos y probablemente puede solucionar muchos problemas que a lo mejor no siendo económicos son problemas emocionales, son problemas que tienen que ver con la gestión de las personas y para eso los jugadores pueden aportar muchísimo. Y luego creo que también es muy interesante la propuesta que se ha lanzado de que FIFA y FIPRO apadrinen cursos de formación que puedan dotar a los exjugadores de, muchas, de, de, de esa formación que sea necesaria para, para manejar el fútbol. Y realmente hay que romper esa burbuja también en la que viven los, los jugadores, ¿no? En la que viven y trabajan los jugadores. Yo recuerdo un ex, gran exjugador del Barcelona de hace muchos años,
que después de retirarse me comentó que la primera situación comprometida que había tenido había sido al llegar a un aeropuerto, porque después de viajar por toda Europa no sabía sacar una tarjeta de embarque. <risa> Esto es un caso real que habla de esa burbuja, ¿no? Esto sí, ya sí. ha cambiado mucho y afortunadamente todo el mundo ya sabe manejar las aplicaciones. Pero yo creo que se han dicho cosas muy importantes y se ha dicho también que el fútbol tiene una crisis de valores y para eso los jugadores yo creo que tenéis mucho que... Tienen mucho que aportar. Creo que es un balance que necesita ser hecho por las personas de business. No, fútbol no, no es solo business, fútbol es también es más que un, solo un deporte y hay que tener un balance completo entre todos. Son personas y son emociones. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.